All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the Family Center for Recovery Family Weekend. My name is James and I am the Director of Admissions and Family Services here at the Family Center for Recovery. We're really glad you can all make it out this weekend. As many of you know, this is a crucial part of the recovery process. We have had families not attend Family Weekend and the patients ended up leaving and the families never understood some of the interventions and some of the experiences that we shared with them. You know, yes, our loved ones are in treatment, but at the same time, it is very difficult. And I know that the, the months, the years for some of us leading up to your loved one going into treatment, whether this is their first treatment, whether they've been to multiple treatment centers, has been heartbreaking, roller coaster, ups and downs. Um, and we feel such a lack of control. And really over this weekend, we're going to try to explain and get everybody to understand that it's not our fault. We cannot blame ourselves, but there are things that we can do to best help our loved one live a healthy life in recovery. Okay. So a <coughs> little bit about my story. Um, I'm originally from New York. I have a great family, um, very, very supportive. Um, my brother is uh, currently a computer engineer, um, a software engineer, excuse me. He has a family. I have two nieces. Um, he's always somebody that I looked up to. But at the same time, I was always sort of, you know, feeling a little bit down because I couldn't live up to that expectation. Um, I felt that my father and my mother always had a high expectation for me. Um, and granted, um, any, any parent um, would want the best for their loved one. But they couldn't be happier now today knowing where I am and seeing where I am, not only living an independent life, but also giving back and sharing my experiences to help other patients. Um, I'm extremely blessed in that matter. So I was raised, great house, um, and by the time I graduated high school, I had started hanging out with the wrong crowd. Um, I really started to start doing things that really wasn't in my nature. Um, and I knew they were bad, but I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be liked. Um, so peer pressure was a huge part of my story, and it took me a long time to admit that. Um, <coughs> I ended up uh, making it into college, and I actually had an academic and an athletic scholarship to the College of St. Rose in Albany, New York. That was something my parents were extremely proud of, um, as myself. Uh, it was something I worked really hard for. However, my whole life, my father and my mom had my back. No matter what I was doing, good or bad, they were always there to support me. The problem was, while I was doing the bad things, getting in trouble smoking weed, being out late, um, lying about my whereabouts, they weren't really aware of the seriousness of the disease happening. They weren't educated. Um, and it really wasn't until they made it to a family weekend that they started to really understand how important it is to be educated. Um, especially on mental health and addiction issues. There's such a lack of education in the entire um, society that it's been getting a little bit better, uh, but there's still a lot, a lot to learn. <coughs> so after I started college there, I thought I had it made. I thought I didn't have to put the work in, the effort. You know, I had everything I wanted my whole life, um, and now I thought college, my degree was going to be given to me as well. Um, I found out the hard way that was not the case. Um, and after about a year, I did, I got kicked off my team um, due to academic and other reasons. Um, and I was really struggling with what to do next. So I started working a full-time job. I went back into community college and I was really lost. Um, I was trying to fit in with different crowds. I was trying to figure out my way, but really I wasn't. <coughs> my dad was paying my car payments. My dad was making sure I was, I was taken care of. And it wasn't his fault, even though he feels a little bit guilty about it. Um, it wasn't his fault. He didn't understand that he shouldn't be giving in to me. Um, so I went into treatment, came out of treatment, relapsed immediately, went into another treatment, so on and so forth. I ended up going to six treatment centers all up in New York. Um, every single one of them, my parents were like, a miracle child, he, he's cured, yeah. They didn't know that just by completing a treatment program that I really wasn't. I wasn't okay. Um, <coughs> so I learned the hard way, kept relapsing. I got shipped around between mom's house, dad's house until they said enough, um, enough is enough. We can no longer give into this. You have one option and one option only. Otherwise you do not have a place to live. You're going to go to Florida. Um, so I did, I was at that, t at that point in my life 
where I was tired. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. It's one of the um, AA slogans that you'll hear very often. And I did. I, I, with little resistance, I came down. But once I got here is when I started resisting. Once Family Center for Recovery, formerly known as Wellington Retreat, tried to get me to change, I resisted. I resisted everything. I hated everybody. My therapist, my doctor, anybody that talked to me, other patients, I didn't like because they were telling me what to do. <coughs> it wasn't until about three or four weeks into my treatment, um, there was a situation where I had kept breaking rules. And one morning, Dr. Moran sat there in community and said to me, James, you can no longer stay here. Um, and that was a mess for me. I started crying, I was, I was broken. Um, but the worst part about that for me at the time was that my family wasn't gonna help me either. Um, so it was the first time I was out on my own, had to figure out what to do. Spiritual awakening, um, and I'll talk about it to this day as a spiritual awakening. It was the first time there was nobody there to swoop in and pick me up and put me back on my feet. Um, and that was a real, real eye opener for me. So I came back begging, please, please give me another chance. The Family Center for Recovery is always willing to give a patient another chance if they want it. They just have to advocate for it. So I did, I ended up getting back in, extremely grateful for that experience. Maybe I didn't feel that way at that time, I just wanted a place to sleep, but over time I started to really learn why they did that. Um, and there was a lot of ups and downs through the way. Um, after six months, there was a family weekend and uh, my behaviors led to not being allowed to see my mother. Um, and it was something that really broke me down. Um, it was something I really wanted to do for a long time. But my behaviors didn't warrant to do that. Um, granted, after a week, I behaved. I started fixing the things that were told to me by my psychiatrist, Dr. Moran. Um, and I ended up earning to ha having dinner with my mother. And it was something that, at the time, I hated. I was like, how could this guy say this to me? Um, why would he do such a thing? You know, he's evil. But the fact is, I have to learn these things. If I don't learn them, how, how am I going to continue to do them for the rest of my life? Um, things have to change. The fact is, I was living a life that didn't work. The proof is in the pudding. Lost my scholarship, pushed my family away, and lost all my friends. It didn't work. When I came here, they said, we're going to make you change. Um, and it was a real, real eye-opener for me. It wasn't all fun and games, especially for the first month or two. But as time went on, they taught me how to reintegrate into society. They had, me, they had me go to meetings. I met people. I got a sponsor. I started hanging out with people on the holidays. And I started to feel a lot better about myself. Um, so I really owe my, si my sobriety um, not only to myself. I did. I worked hard for it. Um, but to the Family Center for Recovery um, and everything that they've done for me. As hard as it was, you know, in, in the moment, I always complained about it. But now, today, I see why they did what they did, and I'm forever grateful for that. So that's pretty much my story. Um, I also wanted to talk about one or two other things. This weekend, um, especially tomorrow morning, we're going to ask that you guys get there at 8 a.m., and we'll talk about it a little bit, a little bit later in the lecture. Um, and the Al-Anon meeting, in case any of you leave early tonight, um, for whatever reason, please don't. Um, the Al-Anon meeting, if you do not attend it, you will not be able to have dinner with your loved one tomorrow night. The Al-Anon meeting is at 5.30 p.m. tomorrow and will be held in this room, okay? And it's being run by one of our um, Wellington Retreat Family Center for Recovery uh, family alumna, um, a great, great woman that has a lot, a lot of experience. Um, so it's really something we ask you to be at. Um, so with that being said, I will introduce you to Dr. Moran. present. Where? Open your eyes instead of your mouth. Gypsy, meet Miss Mazeppa, Miss Electra. Say, you're even younger than I was when I started stripping. Oh, I'm not going to strip. Something wrong with stripping? No, I just meant I don't have any talent. You think they have? <laughs> I myself, of course, was a ballerina. But take it from me, 
To be a stripper, all you need to have is no talent. You'll pardon me. But to have no talent is not enough. What you need to have is an idea that makes you strip special. <laughs> Pull all the stops out till they call the cops out. Grind till you're fine or you're banned. But you gotta get a gimmick if you wanna get a hand. You can sacrifice your sacro working in the back row. Bump in a dump till you're dead. Kid, you gotta get a gimmick if you wanna get a hand. That's how Burlesque was born. So I uh, and I uh, and I uh, 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 but I do it with a horn. <laughs> In town, you gotta have a gimmick if you wanna have a chance. Get your attention? <laughs> what musical, Broadway musical, is this from? It, loud. Gypsy, of course. <laughs> Natalie Wood. <coughs> What the hell does this have to do with uh, what we're here for? <laughs> <coughs> By the way, I just read the other day that uh, Barbara Streisand is thinking about returning to Broadway next year to, to play Mama Rose in this musical as a revival. <coughs> Should be amazing. Well, <coughs> as I look around the room, I see many of my old friends. I appreciate you returning to Family Weekend. And by the way, what the hell are you all doing in South Florida in the middle of August? <laughs> not warming up up north? <laughs> it's worse. <coughs> so I thought, gosh, you know, I so appreciate the repeat offenders, that is, all of you wonderful families returning every two months for Family Weekend, but I also thought, gosh, they got to hear me drone on and on and on about psychiatric illness, and they come back and hear pretty much the same thing. So I started to feel a bit of an obligation to entertain you. <laughs> but I'm not an entertainer. <coughs> I figured I had to get a gimmick. That's what made me think of uh, Gypsy. So your loved ones tell us all the time that all we try to do here is brainwash them and you. They say that to me, and my response is, of course we do. <coughs> you come to us with your brains full of schmutz. We're here to wash out the schmutz. So we take each individual brain, and we scrub away getting rid of the schmutz until they're nice and shiny and clean. And that's how we discharge you. Now, <coughs> let me tell you what the schmutz is. That's what you're going to learn here today and for the rest of the weekend. The scientific term, psychopathology, disease of the mind. Now I have to get a little more serious. <coughs> I don't have to tell you how you have been affected by the diseases of your loved ones. In fact, you know, we came to realize that our former name, Wellington Retreat, just didn't really capture the essence of what we do. And that is, we treat the families. 
your loved one's major psychiatric syndromes, about which you'll learn today, don't only affect them, they affect their relationships with you. You are not only affected by them, but you, in many ways, inadvertently contribute to maintaining those illnesses in your loved ones. We will teach you a lot about enabling the illness. We want you to learn how to enable recovery. I know that sometimes it's very easy to fall into the old habit of thinking that you are doing well, that you are helping your loved one, when in reality, the action you're about to take is going to ensure that that illness does not respond to recovery, rather that it's maintained. Nobody in the front row. You all afraid of me? <coughs> Wait till tomorrow in community meeting. <laughs> That's when my clothes come out. Well, <coughs> I'm going to share an, uh, a personal anecdote. And I hope you don't mind. I tend to do that a lot in this lecture. I think it tends to make real uh, what otherwise might seem a little dry and theoretical. So I had an employee <coughs> who was in recovery herself, and she was a wonderful employee. Don't tell my other employees, but she was one of my favorites. She had a wonderful personality, a great work ethic. She was very young, <coughs> but uh, she rose uh, from a coordinator. She was promoted throughout the ranks and eventually became the manager of a department. She was very open about her, uh, her recovery. However, I thought uh, one day she w didn't seem herself. And I addressed it with her, and she confessed that she had recently relapsed. It had been a couple of weeks she was using benzodiazepines mostly, some opiates. <coughs> so we agreed she had to go back into treatment immediately her family was up north. She didn't really have much of a support system, didn't have any close friends. And so I was pretty much it. I wanted her to go to California. She needed to get away from Florida. Little places and things. You'll hear more about that later in the lecture. And she agreed, finally. She was reluctant at first. The earliest flight we could get out was the next day. What are we going to do tonight? She lived alone. It would have been dangerous for her to go back to her apartment. No one else was available. I said, you're coming home with me tonight. She agreed. I brought her home. <coughs> the night was uneventful. The next morning, she had packed. She was ready to go to the airport. <coughs> and I was saying goodbye. And the idea occurred to me that she was going to be on that flight from Florida to California. Pretty long flight. She's probably going to get thirsty, probably going to get hungry. I took out my wallet and grabbed a $20 bill, and I went like this and stopped in midair. What the hell are you doing? I put it right back. But I learned a lesson. Even I can enable the illness without even recognizing it. So we know how difficult it is for you. <coughs> and that's why we want to put so much of an effort into helping you to become experts. By the way, speaking of being an expert, we need you. We need you to learn everything you can about these psychiatric illnesses that your families suffer from, <coughs> fam family members suffer from. Today, we're going to learn about the major psychiatric syndromes. In the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatry, <coughs> which is now in its fifth edition, there are identified approximately 350 psychiatric illnesses. Most of those can be treated pretty effectively on an outpatient basis. You don't have to come into a complicated treatment program like this. But the major psychiatric syndromes, on the other hand, require much more complex treatment. And they include the psychotic disorders, such as schizophrenia, schizophreniform disorder, schizoaffective disorder, <coughs> the mood disorders, including major depressive disorder, bipolar 1 and 2 disorders, 
the anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, and the personality disorders, to name most of them. <coughs> I'm going to teach you about all of them today. We're going to spend the first half of our time together focusing on the most common uh, syndrome that brings people to this level of care, and that is addiction. Most patients who suffer from addiction, by the way, have an additional psychiatric illness. We call it a comorbid, you know, sick at the same time, comorbid illness. So someone with addiction may have an anxiety disorder, a personality disorder, a psychotic disorder at the same time. <coughs> so we will address the other major psychiatric syndromes in the latter half of the presentation. I think um, James pretty much oriented you to uh, what's going to be happening, but let me just take you from my perspective through the weekend. You learn to be the experts in these disorders today. I really need you to pay attention. The more you learn, the more you will be able to know what your healthy choice should be when you're faced with the choice in interacting with your loved one going forward. Tomorrow morning, we put it into effect when we sit in community meeting, the most important modality, in my mind, of <coughs> treatment at this level of care, or at these higher levels of care. You'll learn more about those dynamics tomorrow and see them in action. And you'll see the expression of the symptoms that your loved ones are experiencing. In the afternoon, after lunch, you'll get more specific presentations from various staff members uh, regarding the various interventions and the services that we provide, including transitional living. Of course, there'll be uh, <coughs> the Al-Anon meeting tomorrow night. I know James emphasized it. We think it's extremely important. We've come to appreciate how we can actually tell within our community of patients, whether you are working in Al-Anon program. They pick it up. You're providing the safety net that's in their mind, and that safety net is nice and firm, but unhealthy, if you are not working in Al-Anon program. If you haven't been and you're not working in Al-Anon program, I'm sure what I'm saying sounds like Chinese. <coughs> but I don't think it takes too much to get you convinced. So we mandate that you attend this one meeting. And then on Sunday, we'll return to the ballroom again. We'll sit in our own community. Me and all of you and our outpatients who have achieved the last level before discharge, and that is level four in transitional living. I invite them every family weekend because <coughs> I think that uh, when you're hearing from them how some of our apparently, quote, crazy interventions have actually helped them to get healthy, you heard a couple from James, <coughs> then you have a little more confidence in what, you d what we do rather than just hearing it from me. They get to uh, help provide understanding of various aspects of our program. <coughs> By the way, just a little bit about myself. I don't, I don't even think I told you my name. Some of you don't know it. <laughs> Dr. Robert Moran, <laughs> medical director and uh, chief executive officer of the Family Center for Recovery. A little bit about myself. I won't go into too much detail unless you have specific questions. Um, <coughs> attended uh, college at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. It was uh, a cultural experience that was very different from the one I, I grew up in, which was... Um, poor to lower middle class. I grew up on a farm, had multiple chores to do when I was in childhood, uh, <coughs> slopping the pigs and feeding the cows and planting the garden, making dinner every night, doing grocery shopping. Come from a family of hard work. Neither my mother nor my father graduated high school, <coughs> but they both went on to develop small businesses for themselves, instilled quite the work ethic in me. They both came from very large families, six siblings on both sides. I was the first one ever to graduate high school, let alone go to college. I had no one to help me with those college applications. I had to figure it out on my own. I uh, studied biochemistry at Trinity. I was named the President's Biochemistry Fellow, graduated salutatorian. From there, 
I went to the big city of New York, scared to death. I didn't know what it was like to, <coughs> to uh, ride a bus. I couldn't understand why the bus driver wouldn't give change. You had to have the exact change getting on a bus. This is a new phenomenon. I grew up on a tractor, and here I am riding a bus down Fifth Avenue. Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Upper East Side. <coughs> Another cultural shock for me, uh, because it's a, a, a Jewish school. I was raised Catholic. I had only met one Jewish person in uh, my life prior to that. <coughs> Very unusual, but it was a wonderful culture. Except <sighs> this first year of medical school <coughs> was all held in the Annenberg building on the Upper East Side of Manhattan on the 12th floor. Well, I quickly learned that on the Sabbath, the Orthodox Jews could not work. Pressing an elevator button counts as work. So every Friday night and Saturday, <coughs> the elevators were reprogrammed to stop on every floor. I'd have to go into the anatomy lab to study, and I'd have to take those elevators that stopped at all 12 floors. It taught me patience. So, let's see. I was awarded the uh, Morris B. Bender Award for Excellence in the Neurosciences. It's the only award given to a medical student at Mount Sinai. And then I went over to Cornell, New York Presbyterian Hospital. Now Cornell has an affiliation with Columbia, so it's this huge conglomerate. There are approximately 1,200 psychiatrists in the Department of Psychiatry. <coughs> I finished my residency in psychiatry. By the way, it's four years of medical school and then four years of general psychiatry, and then you can go beyond that for specialties. Geriatric psychiatry, um, consultation liaison, child adolescent psychiatry. You have a few others, including addiction psychiatry. <coughs> I was later certified in addiction psychiatry and then certified in addiction medicine. They're completely different disciplines. And things have evolved over the years since then now such that there are actual residencies in addiction medicine. So someone can complete four years of medical school and then go on to do a residency in addiction medicine. There are also fellowships in addiction medicine and addiction psychiatry. <coughs> so we've come a long way not only in psychiatry, but particularly with regard to addiction. Uh, let's see. I want you to. Well, it, it's uh, not a pretty picture. I, you know, if for listeners uh, who have someone in their family who's affected by a mental illness, uh, they know what the challenge is today to get either access to care or high quality care. Uh, this is a situation we probably would not tolerate for the treatment of other serious medical problems like cancer and heart disease. The fact that many people with a mental illness end up being incarcerated in jail rather than seen in the medical care system, that we have a huge proportion of people who are homeless and who are not receiving care at all. The, the range of difficulties for those with a disabling illness like schizophrenia uh, is uh, just hard to even put into words this sort of non-system we have today. Uh, in some ways, the system we had 50 years ago where we had a state mental health system, including uh, hospitals that provided care, not great care, but at least provided safety and a refuge for people with uh, severe mental illness, had some benefits that were actually lacking today in a situation where there is no system. There is really no net for people who have these uh, most disabling illnesses. And I need to point out that these are uh, not just as disabling, they're more disabling. According to the World Health Organization and the Institute for Health Metrics that have actually looked at what causes morbidity and mortality, what, what are the sources of disability for some 291 health conditions and injuries, the group of neuropsychiatric disorders, the brain disorders come up at the top. That is, they are more disabling than cancer or heart disease or diabetes. You can go down the list. They're also more costly. Uh, and yet, we're not doing a very good job of providing either the access or the quality of care that people with these disorders. We like to consider Family Center for Recovery as a, um, <coughs> an academic 
uh, facility. We have um, affiliations with many schools. I'm on the faculty of, I think, six, uh, maybe seven medical schools, including Cornell, University of Miami, uh, Florida Atlantic University, Nova Southeastern, uh, <coughs> and others. We have uh, relationships with um, about 45 physician assistant schools across the country. So these schools send their students to us to learn psychiatry. They come from around the country. It's a tremendous experience for, for us as well as your loved ones. <coughs> I like to say, it's okay. If he has something to say, tell him to speak up. <coughs> Actually, let me ask uh, the, the students and residents to come on up front. I want you to meet everybody. <coughs> Uh, so they come for either four, five, or six-week rotations <coughs> from, from the various schools. Come on over here. <coughs> we have uh, both third-year medical students, sometimes fourth-year medical students, and second-year psychiatry residents. Sometimes we have um, an addiction fellow. This is someone who's already completed a residency. Uh <coughs> And just when we get to know them and become attached to them, they leave us and go on to another rotation. I tell them that I remember the patients I helped take care of when I was in third year medical school, and that was 1987. I can even tell you the names of some of them, what their illnesses were, what the treatment was, and what their response to treatment was. They will never forget any of your loved ones. They are helping to teach them about psychiatry, and they will take those experiences throughout their career. So I thought this would be a good time uh, to introduce each other so they can put, by the way, we talk about you all the time. Do your ears ring? <coughs> They've heard so much about you. They're dying to meet you in person. Now, the way we normally do this is I want you to start and just say the first name and the first initial of the last name of your loved one. We have multiple patients with the same first name, so we need the first initial. Please do not say the uh, last name of your loved one because we try to keep things confidential. And then once you've introduced yourself, by the way, also tell us what your relationship is to the, that particular love, loved one. And then who's, whoever has been taking care of that patient, you raise your hand and introduce yourself your name, the school you're from, and where you're originally from. Okay? Good. Well, I'm Jason Lee's grandfather. And? Cindy Payne, Jason grandmother. You don't have to tell us your last name, by the way. <laughs> uh, I'm Andrew Cordes. I go, I'm a fourth year student at New uh, Southeastern, uh, and um, I'm originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Now, I want you all to really speak up because you don't have microphones and we're being recorded. Uh, I'm me. I'm uh, Rodrigo. Um, Carlos Rodrigo's R. Beth. Uh, I'm Lindsay Hack. I'm a PhD. Lousy? I'm Lindsay Hack. I'm a PhD student from Philadelphia um, University. I'm originally from St. Mary's, Georgia. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'm Angie. And I'm David Ballard, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm a third year medical student from Econ. Marcy, Stephen S. <coughs> and of course, no one here has been working with Stephen because he left a while ago. But thank you for coming anyway. <laughs> No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> so pay attention. They're all going to get one. Okay. I'm Dave. And we're the parents of Jamie S. I'm Khadija. Um, 
I'm actually from uh, Yorktown, Virginia, and I go to Nova Southeastern with their good med student there. Nice to meet you. I'm Ellen, and I'm the mother to Catherine J. Hello, David. I'm Allison, and David K is my husband. Um, I work <laughs> Although, he was talking about looking forward to attending the wedding, and I said, who the hell gave you permission? I know. <laughs> I know. Just slap him right down in that. Hi, I'm Lisa. We're on Corey Kay's pets. Hi. Hi, I'm Sherry, and I'm here at Ars Mom. Hi, I'm Raquel. I'm Raquel. <laughs> I'm Ricardo, Ricardo G's father. Oh, you're funny. I'm Hi, I'm Chris I'm Alex, their mother. Hi, my name is Dr. Dominguez. Um, I'm originally from Maryland. I graduated from Nova Southeastern uh, Medical School, and I'm currently a resident at Larkin Community. I am Phil and Barbara, and we're the parents of Michael B. That's me. My name is Samantha Ruder. Um, I'm a physician assistant at Marietta College with Ohio, but I'm originally from Michigan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Hello, my name is Kevin. I'm a community organizer slash educator. Also been a recovering person. Uh, I just wanted to come in to get caught up on the latest because I do a lot of drug ed uh, throughout Palm Beach County to our high schoolers. And they're so bright, so I wanted to make sure I was given the correct information. So that's why I'm here to learn as much as I can to pass it along. Welcome. We always welcome anyone to come in and be a I'm Sarah. She's working with Paul. But we don't get to see him nearly as much as we would like. Hi, I'm Nelson. Uh, my cousin is Ricardo G. <laughs> but they know. Stop University, studying clinical mental health uh, counseling. 
So that's part of my training to come to the Founding Center to learn. And I think this is January, and I'll be done next April. You know, Gene, I'm, I'm glad that you are here. And I apologize for uh, not remembering that we also have mental health interns. Yes. <laughs> you are. I'm Steve, and I'm the uh, older brother to Tim O. Awesome. My name's Raquel. I'm with him. Hi, Raquel. He's my uncle. I'm my son. <laughs> You're Tim's son? Yeah, I'm from Corio. That is Tim O. I'm Emilio, and I'm um, Tim's my dad. Awesome. I'm Allison, I'm Tim O's wife. Hi. Great to meet you guys. I'm Garcia, Sabi, and Jay, my son. Hi. 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 <laughs> All right, have a seat, everybody. Thank you. <coughs> Do I have to hit it twice? Oh. oh, that's right. Just a list of the many, many schools. <coughs> and by the way, we're under a microscope all the time <coughs> because the deans, the department chairmen, the program coordinators, come from around the country to see this place, Family Center for Recovery. What the hell are you doing? Are you teaching our students the way we want you to teach them? They're looking at the quality of care that we provide all the time. <coughs> Keeps us on our toes. What's the name of this organ? See how readily you recognize it? <coughs> You're going to be great anatomists. By the way, I, I, I'm distracted by something, <coughs> and that is Jordan's husband. I just want to compliment you on how healthy and strong you are. It's because of you that your daughter, your wife is in our program. Thank you. Appreciate that. <coughs> so, the most complicated organ of the body. <coughs> it looks pretty simple, looks like a sponge, but in fact, as you will see, it's extremely complex. Responsible for every function of the body, essentially, <coughs> certainly controlling functions throughout the body. Now, there are a number of different medical specialties that focus on different functions of this organ. So there's no real brain specialist. For example, the neurologists, they focus on the part of the brain that is responsible for movement, the motor cortex, you'll learn about that in a bit, or the sensory cortex. They're responsible for diagnosing and treating strokes, certain demyelinating diseases. Mm. The psychiatrists, on the other hand, focus on different parts of the brain, those responsible for judgment, executive function, impulse control, mood regulation, and others that you're about to learn. <coughs> The endocrinologists focus on still other parts of the brain, the, the pituitary gland, for example, the hypothalamus, and others. <coughs> so we're going to start with a quiz. If you can all answer these questions perfectly, the lecture is over. <laughs> Fair enough? All right. What structure in the brain is responsible for experiencing pleasure? A, the prefrontal cortex. B, the nucleus accumbens. C, the nucleus of stimulation. Or D, I don't experience pleasure. <laughs> How many say A? Raise your hand. Okay. How many say B? What about C? And D? You got that one right. <clears throat> but not all of you got the correct answer. So sit back and get comfortable. All right, number two. What step in AA is concerned with taking one's moral inventory? 
Step one, seven, four, 12. I skipped that step. <coughs> How many say step one? Got one. Step seven? Step four? Hmm. Step 12. No takers for 12? You're smart. Number three, what medicine is an antagonist at the mu opioid receptor? Are these too easy for you? <coughs> A, Tylenol, B, Suboxone, C, Naltrexone, D, Atenolol, E, I never take medicine. So how many people say Tylenol? Got one, two, Suboxone. Okay, Naltrexone. Atenolol. You never take medicine? <laughs> Lucky, healthy, good genes. All right, <clears throat> got a lot to learn. Four, recovery means the absence of symptoms. True or false? Or both true and false? How many say true? Recovery means the absence of symptoms. No? It's false? You're all going for both true and false? Wow, it's unanimous. Hmm. And the last one. Which two types of psychotherapy have been proven to change the structure of the brain? A, psychoanalysis and cognitive behavioral psychotherapy. B, cognitive behavioral psychotherapy and motivation enhancement therapy. C, motivation enhancement therapy and 12-step facilitation. D, dialectical behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral psychotherapy. Or E, the brain does not change. How many say A? Okay, B? C? One person on C. Hmm, I wonder why. D? And E? Hmm. <coughs> Do you know, when I was in medical school, 1985 to 89, we thought that E was the correct answer. The brain doesn't change. The adult brain, that is. Once you reach the adult brain, that's the brain you're stuck with. Thank God we were wrong. I'll explain what that means later. All right. <coughs> so things are getting a little complex pretty quickly, right? The various functions that are <coughs> governed by just the surface of the brain. Imagine when you start to get down deep. Now, the orientation is as if I'm facing in this direction. So that's the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. So you see functions like muscle coordination, sounds of language, body senses, motor system controlling muscles, <coughs> inhibitions, when to say no and not act on a behavior. All functions observed by specific areas of the brain. <coughs> they all have names. The occipital lobe, for example, responsible for vision. The temporal lobe, responsible for hearing. I'm activating your temporal lobes in every person in the room right now, as well as your occipital lobes. You're looking at things. There's an area responsible for speech, Broca's area. <coughs> Let me go off on one of those tangents again. After completing medical school, my first year of residency at Cornell, <coughs> the very first month, by the way, of internship, internship is the same thing as the first year of residency, I had to do a rotation. Plenty of seats up front. Come join us. They all saved them for you. <coughs> Welcome. I was assigned to the <coughs> Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute, probably the most famous cancer institute in the world. <coughs> it was right across the street from New York Hospital. So I got to do a month of neurology there. In fact, it was neurosurgery. That was the unit I was assigned to. So I show up on <coughs> day one, and I am told that I am on call that night. So I had to work all day, all night, and all the next day, nonstop. 
I was responsible for 40 very, very sick patients. My first night out of medical school, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. There were no residents there. There were no attendings. It was me and the nurses. Thank God for the nurses. <laughs> I finally had completed all of the work that I had to do. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. I just wanted to lay my eyes lay my head down, close my eyes for a few minutes. I went into the on-call room. Just as I was falling asleep, the nurse buzzes me. Oh, back then we had beepers. Those loud, searing beepers. <coughs> I call her. She said, <coughs> we, have, we have this patient. His, his blood pressure is, I don't know, something through the roof. Uh, he, he's sweating. He's complaining of chest pain. She said, what do you want to do? I said to myself, I have no idea. I said, what do you normally do in this case? <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, we usually do this, 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 and this. I said, that sounds great. Let's do that. <laughs> From that moment on, I have always appreciated nurses. <clears throat> All right. So during that rotation, um, I had an, uh, an experience of meeting someone who had an unfortunate experience. And that was... He was the, um, the director of the security uh, for, the, for, for the hospital, and he was giving a lecture, much like I'm doing right now. <coughs> and all of a sudden, as he's giving the lecture, he sees perplexion on the faces of his audience members. And so he stopped. What's wrong? And somebody said, you can't hear yourself? You're not making any sense. It's just garble. So... They took him to the emergency room. <coughs> he had an MRI. He was admitted to my floor. The MRI showed a tumor. And the tumor was located right there in Broca's area. He had a biopsy the next day. It turned out to be something called a glioblastoma multiform, which is one of the most severe brain tumors a person can have. He was in his 50s. <coughs> that was his only symptom. As he was talking, he started to not make sense indicating very specific functions in very specific areas of the brain. Hmm. <laughs> this is just to show how complicated the circuits are deeper in the brain. Communication is key. <coughs> the building blocks of the brain called neurons, nerve cells. You all remember from ninth grade biology what a cell is, right? Cytoplasm, cell membrane, Nucleus. Nucleus is sort of the brain of the cell. <coughs> well, we have, gosh, the students will have to help me. When I was in medical school, I was taught there were about 100 different kinds of cells of the body. What do they tell you now? Anyone? Enzo, help me. 100 or more? More. Different specialized cells. The neuron is one type, and of course there are a number of different kinds of neurons, but we're going to just talk about a neuron in general. <coughs> A neuron has to communicate with another neuron in order for the brain function to occur. Just keep that in mind for now. We'll come back to it. <coughs> this is the anatomy of a teenager's brain. <coughs> <laughs> Love for parents is pretty big. Car keys craving. Rebellion center. <coughs> of course, the most important, the birds and the bees lobes. 